what's really just interesting to me about this is like I was telling myself that I was doing hard things because they were hard just relative to everyone else. John, I'll do you one better. I said, have you ever played pool? He says, yeah. I said, I played jujitsu like pool. You got to call your shot before and I'll even give you a countdown. So our ability mm. to take our natural impulses and subordinate them to our own value system to say, no, my values are greater than my impulses. That's the essence of a proactive person. But the hard thing is, wow. is a lot of times people, they get introduced to who they really are and they don't like who they really are. As I started doing jujitsu, I realized as I was fully focused, trying my best, all of my weaknesses started coming out again and they were just <laughs> exposed. So you go, you go take a joint, ligament, bone, whatever, yeah. and you put it in the stressed so there's the stressed position and then you have you have a doctor do an MRI on it so he can tell you yeah. what's happening in the joint. Yeah. <laughs> and how to properly to break it. What's up guys? Uh, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, thanks for tuning in. So this is our second episode of the Anti-Fragile podcast. I wanted to just explain briefly why we wanted to name it this, why Rich and I wanted to name it Anti-Fragile. The first reason is, so I really like history and Roman history is one of my favorite eras. Um, I was watching and, and I've been studying a lot about uh, Michael Saylor, who's the CEO of MicroStrategy. And he brought up this really interesting point about the Romans. Um, and one of the things that caused the Romans to become so dominant in their territories and as a military force, um, and which led to their rise in power. And uh, that idea was that they became anti-fragile. So they were constantly seeking to go fight battles rather than waiting for those battles to come to them. And uh, since Rich has a background in martial arts and is a third degree black belt in jujitsu, since I've been training and kind of going along that journey of the uh, trying to master the mental game and get better and better and progress um, in my own life and do that through martial arts and jujitsu, since I'm, uh, I'm very much a rookie in that, it's been really interesting for me to see how this idea of being anti-fragile correlates and bleeds into really everything that I do for my career in sales. Um, and it's a, it's a useful and really impactful concept when applied to the things that are most important in life. So that's why we wanted to call it anti-fragile. There's a couple highlights from this episode that were really meaningful to me. We, we went off on a few tangents that were really cool, like very organic and super insightful. Um, one of them was, I, I shared a quote or a, an excerpt from a book that I read every year called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Very popular book. I'm not sure how popular it really is currently, but it's it's a very impactful book. And the, it, it's from the habit, habit one, which is be proactive. And it's like truly what it actually means to be proactive, a proactive person. And how when you're a proactive person, you can choose to change your life in a way that's very significant and meaningful. I share some insights at the beginning of the podcast of my what I'm learning uh, from the mental game of jujitsu and how that I had a really cool experience, how this applied to just me and my own personal life and uh, hopefully making it so that I have a better relationships with, uh, with my wife, with my friends, with the people that I work with, people around me. Really cool how it crossed over, the, like, because I, I, I've been loving my jujitsu journey because of the mental game and how that impacted. I started to see some really cool direct applications to my own life. So you'll, you'll have to really listen to that. It's right at the beginning. There's a cool part where Rich talks about John Jones and training with John Jones. As Rich Chavez was, one of the coaches at Jackson's in Albuquerque where John Jones trained and I think he still trains there. So he shares some very interesting insights about the arguably the greatest uh, martial artist UFC fighter um, of our era. So that's cool to watch. You'll have to listen to that story. It's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of insightful. It kind of actually shows you like who John Jones really is, which is interesting. I don't know John Jones, so I don't make any judgments about him, but Rich does uh, very well. So that, that was really cool. And then we, the, the whole, kind of the whole podcast, we talk about this idea of becoming the best version of yourself and what that really means. So hopefully you gain some really cool insights. All I'm asking here is if you like what you're hearing in the podcast, especially if you're watching it on YouTube, 
leave comments as you're watching so that you can show us like what we're doing well and what you like about uh, about the videos. Um, I watch a lot of YouTube to kind of do study on this stuff and, and most people will say, hey, comment so that it helps the YouTube algorithm. It does, but I don't, we don't actually really care about that. We wanted to get to as many people as possible, obviously. But what we're really looking for is if you could comment in places where you find it impactful for your own life, that's really, really helpful for us because then we can go see like, okay, the things that we're saying are resonating with people in this way and then we can talk more about those things. So whatever you find impactful for your own life and why, if you could just leave a comment, that'd be really awesome. If you actually like the video, please like it. Um, don't just like it to like it. Like if you actually like what we're talking about, like the video, please. And then if you if you could share it with people that it's impactful for, if you have someone in situations that we're talking about where like maybe they feel stuck in life and want to change or they're really seeking to level up in what they're doing, um, please share it with them. So like it. And then if you really like what we're doing here, subscribe, that would help us out a ton. Um, yeah, sure for the YouTube algorithm, as a lot of people that I watch say, but more importantly for us so that we can actually see what's impactful and what's not, and we can keep doing the things that are most impactful for the most amount of people. Anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I hope you enjoy the episode. But those are the things we love, right? That's the, that, that right there, though, is what, me, yeah, what got me started mentally. Dude, that's why I'm... Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, that's why I, like, I just can't stop thinking about it. Mostly because, so I, I tend to get like kind of obsessive about things. <laughs> I, I mean, I would, I, that, that, I feel like that might have a little bit of a negative connotation, being obsessive. What I'm trying to say is I tend to go all into everything I do. Yeah. I mean, I, you know this about me, obviously, right? And so when I say I can't stop thinking about like jujitsu, I'm not saying that like, I'm obsessed with jujitsu in the same way that I'm like just that one track mind with something that's like fun. Right. I'm, I can't stop thinking about it because of how it translates to like everything that I'm doing in my life right now, which yeah. that's very different than like, Oh, I have a new hobby that I like, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So it's not just like a new cool thing. It's more of like, I can't stop thinking about it because of like a breakthrough that I just had or like how that applies to what I'm doing in my own life and my, and my barriers in my life itself right now. Yeah, so it's that's easy to relate to your normal life as well, right? So easy. And it's like almost like uh, scary how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Why do you, you laugh at that? Why is that? What does that hit home? Because I always say like jujitsu is who you really are. Like there's yeah. no there's no denying it. How you react off the mats is how you will react on the mats. Yeah. Right. And like really, though, what I'm, what like. It's one thing to say, oh, I'll react this way, or I ask a question and somebody reacts. It's like the majority of the time, somebody either <clears throat> means too far positive or too far negative, right? Very rarely sure. somebody right in the middle and right spot on. Yeah. But in jujitsu, you basically get rid of that. And you get rid of it not only for yourself, but also for them, right? Hmm. So what do you mean can, by that? So like the quote is, um, adversity introduces you to who you really are yeah. as a person, right? And like on the jujitsu mats, if you're really involved and you're really doing it and you're really giving it your best effort, you'll find out who you really are, right? But the hard thing is, wow. is a lot of times people, they get introduced to who they really are and they don't like who they really are. Yeah. Dude, I, see, I definitely see that. I mean, I know for myself, just like, especially this last week was really interesting. We trained twice, right? Monday yeah. and then Tuesday. That's right. And Monday was, I showed up to your class and just didn't realize it was going to be that many experienced people. For some reason, I thought it was like, a, I was imagine like a rookie class in my mind. And it is, that is kind of a be, our beginner's class. No too. way. Yeah, that's the beginner's Interesting. class. Interesting. Well, I didn't ex expect a beginner's class to be or feel like I was going against people that were as experienced as they were Okay. for whatever reason. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was really interesting because I'm like, I was trying really hard to like apply some of the stuff that I learned and apply a few moves and... It just, it, I found myself getting frustrated. Hmm. I found myself getting tired or telling myself that I was getting really tired. Like all yeah. of my, my point is all of my kind of the demons of my old habits that I've had or the things that I, <laughs> what I'm saying is the, the things I don't like about myself quickly came to the surface when I started trying yeah, really absolutely. hard. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So that it, it hits home for me because that was like one of the things that I was faced with this week. And so then the choice is like, do I lie to myself and tell myself that I'm not actually like that? Oh, look at all these things. I'm not actually like that, you know, or, or do I face it 
un- unemotionally, objectively, and say like, well, I don't like that. So what am I going to do? Just stay the same, you know? Absolutely. And, no, and, and it gets ho- complicated for yourself too, right? Like, and not, and <clears throat> think about this. Like, not only does it do that to you mentally, but I remember vividly the moment recognizing that it was doing this to me physically as well. And huh. what I mean is... I remember once I looked, started to look at my ears and I'm like, man, this is changing my ears. Like this <laughs> like is changing the, my they call physical that? appearance, appearance, uh, uh, cauliflower. cauliflower ear. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, it's literally changing the way I look. And I was like, I, am I okay with that? I had to ask myself <laughs> if, if I was okay with that. And then I even had to ask myself like, why wouldn't I be okay with having cauliflower ears? And it made me realize that like, I cared about the way I looked. Oh, uh, more than more than i should well because kind of everyone cares about the way they look at some point right to some extent so yeah you cared about the way that you looked more than you cared about how it was changing you mentally or more than you cared about like getting to the next level of being the best version of yourself exactly Dang, dude. exactly yeah now i dude i remember looking at myself in the mirror and just looking at my ears and almost like doing exactly what you're saying where you're like do i face this or do I just say enough? Like I would rather have a different kind of ears than yeah. prove myself. Or like I don't really even care because the mental aspect that I'm gaining does it like it's far outweighs any of this these negative things. But it takes negative work, things. and it's hard. Yeah, for sure, dude. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I just that was it was it was odd for me because. I'm getting excited about this new thing, right? I'm getting excited about what I'm learning, but then you're quickly just faced with the reality that like you want adversity because if you want to be better, you need adversity to be introduced to who you really are so that you can choose to be better. Absolutely. Um, And that's like one of my break. That was one of my breakthroughs this week. Uh, We should talk about that for a second. Yeah. I want to hear more about that. Um, Well, you were rolling with me in that class on Monday. You know what I'm talking about, right? So, um, yeah, we were, it was after we'd practiced that. what, What moves were we practicing? Cutting the angle. Yeah, so we were we were practicing getting out of the parallel lines, right? The, the knees and and, right. and getting out of those lines and rotating your body is just called ninety degree cuts. They call them so okay. you're cutting the angle. Gotcha. Yeah, so we had practiced that a few times, and then I've got all these things in my head, and I'm like wanting to do them perfectly when we, when we're live, right? And of course, it never works out that way when <laughs> you first try. Never. So then I find myself getting frustrated, and I'm like rolling with you and. Um, it's been a while. I don't know how long we went in that round, but it seemed in my yeah. mind like it was a long time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you just weren't calling the round. So I was like, gosh, man, this is, I'm like, I'm like tired. And then uh, after we stopped that round, you said, the first thing that you said was, you're almost okay with losing if, as long as you're surprised by it. And so you're trying to find something that you can be surprised by so that you can get out of whatever you're feeling. Yeah. I was like, what did you mean by that? I meant like, I think I know, obviously, if but I want you to explain it, it. If you see it happening, you hold yourself to a standard that, that it shouldn't happen. Hmm. Right? You're like, if I know that Rich is doing something, he's not allowed to do it. And I'll fight for my life yeah. to stop it. But if I if don't I know it, what he's doing, yeah. then... I'm okay with I'm okay, I'm okay with not it. trying very hard. I'm yeah. okay with losing. Yeah, which is... I mean, you said it and I was like... Well, I mean, I don't know how I deny that. That's like totally true. Like I feel that that's true. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I expressed back to you and I was like, honestly, dude, I'm exhausted. That's how I feel. And I wasn't saying it as an excuse. I was more so saying it like I'm telling myself I feel exhausted. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is different than saying, Hey, I'm exhausted. I can't do this. And then, um, you said back to me, well, listen, you just have to tell yourself a different story. Like, are you tired? Sure. But like, that's all relative. Right. You could go way harder than you're going and so um or last longer or whatever but you just re-script the story so like if you're saying i'm tired then you need to turn around and say like yeah if i'm tired he's got to be way more tired than me right absolutely so we talked about re-scripting the story and um and then we i think we rolled another round and then uh, after that it's kind of a little bit fuzzy but after that i was like exhausted again and then what did you say? So do you remember what you oh, said? Yeah. yeah. Will you just oh, yeah. say it, uh, explain it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so at the end I'd wanted to ask you, I knew exactly what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. And I wanted you to know that you don't have anything to prove to anybody. Yeah. You have nothing to prove to anybody. So you said that. And then I was like, of course, I don't care about proving anything to anyone else. 
right? Because I thought what I thought you were telling me was like, hey, man, don't worry about losing. You don't have anything to prove to anyone. Because I'm there with one of the guys that I work with. Like, he works for me, essentially, right? And I'm like, but I don't care about that. I'm cool with being vulnerable to everyone I work with. Like, I don't even care. So when you said that, what I thought you were saying was, listen, Hayden, it's okay. You can lose. You don't have anything to prove. I'm like, bro, I don't care. I, I like literally do not care about what anyone thinks about me. I have nothing to prove to anyone. And then what did you say after that? And then I said, accept yourself. <laughs> Dude, yeah, that was huge, right? So, And then you were like, well, then the kicker for me was like, and if you haven't proved it to yourself right now, it's never going to happen. Yeah. And, and I think people like you, that's very important because uh, look what you've done in your life. Yeah. Look what you're doing in your life. And... Uh, Truly, I mean, it's a real, it's the, a real, real thing, and I mean it when I say, if you haven't done it by now, it's it's not ever going to happen. You and know? really, what you're saying, I think, is like, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but what I took from that was like, everyone has to allow themselves to be good with their wins, right? Like they have to allow themselves to understand their true value. Like if I'm not okay with who I am right now, then like based on everything I've done in my life, then I'm never going to be okay with who I am. Right. Is that kind of what yeah. you're getting at? Yeah. In a lot of ways, there's a couple of things you hit the nail on the head with one aspect of it, but really like, and you do this a lot. You do this a lot. Cause you'll like text me a picture and you'll be like, Hey, this is good. I know this is okay, but don't worry. It'll get better. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but really what I, what I think when I see it is I see that's good enough for today. And I know that's not good enough for next year. But that is good enough for today, <laughs> right? Yeah. But you yeah. don't even want to say that it's good enough for today. You're like, I'm so focused on that it'll be better in the future mm. that I'm not even okay saying that I like it now. <laughs> oh, jeez, dude. <laughs> you know, you right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you get so, you, you don't even want to give yourself credit for the moment. Right. You want, you want to say, I know I don't deserve that credit now. But in five years when it, it's super big, then I'll give myself credit. Hmm. But, and what I'm trying to tell you is if you haven't done it now, your five years will be, oh, well, then we'll do it in another five years or another five happen. years. And I think that's exactly what you said. You're like, it ain't never going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and really, when I think about jujitsu, the, the core of jujitsu for me, and this doesn't happen for everybody. Keep in mind, like for me the level that I think of jujitsu, I recognize that it's not for everybody, meaning mm -hmm. there's some people who are going to come in and they're just going to use it for uh, maybe the opportunity to exercise, sure. to drain themselves yeah. and to, to just release pressure. Okay. Right. They're going to go home and feel better about their lives. Right. They don't necessarily need to understand it at the, at the level I'm trying to understand it at, right. at the level I'm trying to teach it at. Right? Which is why I'm obsessed with it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so we see it already differently, but like, what I'm trying to do, which is, is I have you working with a lot of my guys that I work, a lot of my sales guys that I work with in it, my leadership. Exactly. It's so I feel like it's so powerful mentally for overcoming any type of obstacle. But really what I'm trying to get at is I want you to go, when I grapple with somebody, I'm watching them and I'm learning from them. Right. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes right now we're saying, Hey, what was this person thinking? Rich, what did you think? What did you think about this person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do two things. Number one, I'm trying to get people to actually focus on something that takes all their energy, right? I need mm. all your 100% complete focus, right? And if I can get your 100% complete focus, I know that you're not thinking about other things. Hmm. I want you to be in the moment, right? Yeah. And that's important, especially for like, when, especially when I talk to people about like, how can you be your best self? Well, how can you be your best husband? Well, number one, I guarantee you, if you're at your job and you're still responding for text messages for work and you're with your wife, sh that's not being your best, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And our wives will let us know that as well. Yep. But it, it, the opposite is true as well. If I'm at work and I'm having an argument with my wife, I'm not all I'm not being my, my best self. I'm not work. being my best self. Right. And yep. I'm not getting as much done as I can get done. And I believe that none of us are talented enough to multitask like that. Not effectively. Not effectively. Yeah. So number one, I'm trying to get us to learn to teach our minds to do what you're doing in that moment. Be present, right? Or else in jujitsu, you're going to get screwed. hurt, right? <laughs> you're screwed. And that's, and you take, extrapolate, like, as I'm thinking and I guess researching about jujitsu, like, what is it? And I'm not trying to be, I know that I'm naive in this. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. 
what is it? Well, it's like this martial art that is used to essentially in the real world be able to kill someone in a hand-to-hand combat situation yes. if, if necessary yes. or make them submit or stop what they're doing, right? And so if that's if that's kind of the, the metaphor for what jujitsu is, then like that's that's really powerful in the fact, in the sense that if you are not all present, you actually will get hurt. Absolutely. Like actually, right? You'll and actually so get hurt. when you extrapolate that into a marriage, dude, and this is all, I have a quick, I have a story for you that I already told you that I want to tell right now after this to me in, in my marriage too. But if you're actually not all present in your marriage, go try that for five years, <laughs> 10 years and see what happens. You know, maybe you'll get divorced. Maybe you won't, but it won't be very good. No. Yeah. And, and, um, so like, are you not actually hurt there too? Right? Yeah, you are because you weren't present. And, and the injuries that hurt the most. The, the disabilities that hurt more than any other disability is the ones you can't see. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, man. That's uh that's huge. I, um, cause one of the things that I've been learning about myself is I really like to challenge myself, but I'm oftentimes telling myself the story that I'm challenging myself just because I'm doing more than what the normal person would do. I think that's kind of been a theme for me over the last hmm. few years, which is why I wanted to start working with you from like the mental game perspective. Like it's why I called you up that day and was like, dude, let's do a podcast. And then I started thinking, I was like, maybe I could meet with Rich once a week and you could just act like I'm one of your athletes and like train me like I'm in the UFC or something, but I'm like doing sales, you know, but it's all because I didn't want to get complacent. Right. And so, yeah. um, what's really just interesting to me about this is like, I was telling myself that I was doing hard things because they were hard just relative to everyone else. And so I felt like I was getting complacent, which meant as I started doing jujitsu, I realized as I was fully focused, trying my best, all of my weaknesses started coming out again and they were just exposed. It was like taking my guts and just putting them on the table. You know what I mean? And I've oftentimes said this about like, I served a mission for my church and I found that that was the same thing. I tried so hard to do it really well. And what I found was it exposed who I really was. Mm -hmm. And so then I had a choice. Do I go work on those things or not? Right. And obviously I tried to um, very hard. And I found the same thing when I started knocking doors and cold calling people to pay for college. I was like, (laughs) crap, this is exposing who I really am again. And then you go work on it and get better. So jujitsu has done that for me. And one of the things that I've found about myself is that I don't like being uncomfortable. And I think most people don't, everyone doesn't, but I really started to recognize that. And, uh, and so I'll tell myself the story that like, oh, I tried hard. And so therefore it's okay. Like my effort's fine. Right. So I'm cooking <laughs> dinner the other night at home. Okay. Sarah had already ate. I got home really late from work. I had worked like a 14 hour day and I got home and, um, I started cooking some eggs and had some Greek yogurt or whatever. I kind of made a mess in the kitchen. Normally what I would do is I'd give a half hearted effort to clean it up, put some stuff away and then say, <laughs> oh, I'll just get it tomorrow. And I hate admitting this, but it's actually honest, I think. And then Usually Sarah would just do it. Okay. So I get home and I'm like, I start to put stuff away. Right. And I'm faced with this. I'm like, oh, I tried decently hard. I'm thinking I'm really tired. I gave it. And I, and I start telling myself the story, no but the, what's crazy is I started catching the story in my mind. So crazy. Right. Cause yeah. that's just, it's my subconscious. So I'm like, yeah, Aiden, like you tried really hard. Just go to bed. You gave it a good effort today, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that's literally what I said in jujitsu this week. And Rich called it out. And so, mm-hmm. And, and then I start telling myself, I'm like, well, Hayden, you can't take a freaking wipe or like whatever this is, right? You can't go take that and just wipe it off over the counter to make the kitchen clean. How much effort does that take? And, and it just is like my whole life flashed before my eyes thinking about how <laughs> you literally said the same thing to me in different words the day before when you're like, you're not really tired. Come on, man. <laughs> you know? So I was like, why am I obsessed with this? Cause it crosses over. And that's why am I obsessed with like doing the hardest sales job I could possibly do knocking doors because it's just the metaphor for the things that are like most important, you know? Absolutely. And we were talking about that this week, but anyway, that's the story of how it applied. That was my breakthrough this week. It's huge, man. It's yeah. huge. And that, that takes me right to like my second goal of teaching you jujitsu is really like, um, is to get you to go home and think hmm. It's to get you to turn off. Like, how can I say this? We, we are so distracted as humans, right? Yeah. We're so distracted. Like we're in the car, we're hearing music. We're, we have a thousand dollar devices in our pockets that are just constantly binging and distracting us. Right. Sure. We have 
music, we have television, we have our jobs, we have employees, we have our kids, we have our wives. We're constantly distracted, right? Like constantly, constantly. And like what I feel like is the other part of that is I, when I, when I, I want you to go home is I want you to think, which means what? Which means really think, 100% think. I mean, shut off the distractions and think to yourself, hmm. right? Like take that moment to think, what, why am I doing this? Yep. Who am I? And let it help, let you discover who you are yep. and let you see it. Um, and it, it brings me back to like, like there's a quote, there's a quote that I'd wanted to, to talk about that connects with this. And the quote is, um, this is what we, this is how we actually started is we just do a call every week and, uh, we were like, yeah, let's just start with a call every week. This is what I do with my fighters. And then you just would share like your, the insights and breakthroughs and, um, yeah, it's like, this is, I learned a ton doing this anyway, go ahead. So, so here we go. It, I mean, and this is something, uh, I'll just read it and I'll, yeah. I'll go over it. It says all of humanity's problems. Um, and this was said in 1654. Okay. okay. This should be noted. This is, this was said in 1654. It said stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then uh, with that, I've told you this before. A couple a couple uh, months ago, I got really obsessed with like, I wanted to know how to punish people, right? <laughs> but not punish anybody, right? Like, how do you punish the worst criminals in the world, right? Like, how do you, how do you take somebody in like the, in prison, right? Yeah. In the highest level of prison. I've never been in prison, but I would imagine there's levels, right? Sure. I would guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so say, so say, how, how do you take the worst person in there and how do you punish them? Right. And, and we know what they do, right? What, what is it that they do if somebody, if they wanted to punish a criminal? Solitary confinement. Solitary confinement. Right. Which means we put them alone in a room with silence. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause I mean, what else do you do except for face who you are, right? Because you're only there with yourself. Huh. And then let's follow up with that just a little bit, right? Think about this. Like, isn't it wild that, like, we live, like, we know what the CNN effect is, right? Like, constant, constant, constant news, right? Mm -hmm. Constant, constant, constant. But bombard people with like, constant information, Sure. Right. Give them so much information that they're drowning in information while looking for truth. Right. Hmm. They don't know where quite where to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because an, another angle of that is like lawyers. Right. When when, when a company is getting sued and they're a big company, one of the first things those lawyers do is what is they say, well, let's uh, let's bury them in paperwork. Yep. Drown, drown them in the, like all, all of the paperwork. Right. So essentially we as humans sometimes. Uh, and now I'm talking about normal citizens, right? N no longer prisoners, but like normal citizens, we're drowning ourselves in, in information as well, right? Yeah. The internet, Instagram, Facebook, yep. we're doing that same thing, right? So mm -hmm. like we drown ourselves in that information and then we avoid ourselves that solitary confinement. Hmm. And what I want us to be able to do is to learn how to sit quietly by ourselves and have our own thoughts without any distractions. Yeah. Hmm. That's when we really make progress. It's, it's when we're sitting in the kitchen and you're thinking about what happened and who I really am and what do I stand for and what do I represent? Yeah. And am I really tired? <laughs> and even more, yeah, like more importantly, because the obvious answer is that I'm not tired. So more importantly though, being able to put myself in a situation where I'm catching those thought, those lies, because it's hard to catch those lies if you're not mm -hmm. becoming self-aware. Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And, and so like, yeah, the obvious answer when you can take time to actually catch the lies, the obvious answer is like, no, you're not tired. Yeah. But when you're, when you're used to telling yourself the story and you're also drowning out all the truth with just more information, <laughs> more, more information, noise. more notifications. Yeah. This is why I'm wearing a, I mean, it looks like a G-Shock, but like a cheap Garmin <laughs> watch because all I need is my heart rate monitor and I hate getting notifications on my wrist. That's why like my assistant has a phone that is my number that she manages for me. And then only people that I am close with have my personal number because like I just got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. 
Mm-hmm. I can't not, I can't go <laughs> home at night and have still have messages coming in that are seemingly urgent and important at midnight every day. Like I just mm-hmm. can't do it. And, um, but it's for that reason, because I just started to realize like, I don't even know who I'm going to be if I keep this up. Yeah. And right. It, or who I am. It's unsustainable right? too. Yeah. And it's unsustainable. It's draining. It's, um, it's deceptive, right? Because it, yeah. just, it, it kind of just lulls you into, well, I guess if I want to tell myself a lie about who I really am, I just drown it out by watching YouTube videos for a couple hours or whatever the version of that, um, you know, you're going through at the time, but Absolutely. that's interesting, dude. It's, it's, it's wild how we do that to ourselves, right? And how that can be and the greatest form of punishment for someone that is faced with like the evil of themselves. Yes. Wow. Yes. Huh? Right. Like how it's just wild to me that, that we, that we're afraid of that quietness too. Right. Hmm. Like I was talking to one of my fighters today and I'm like, this guy, this guy, uh, that you're coaching. Yeah. That I'm coaching. I won't say his name for now because I, I didn't let him know, but I'm, oh, he's That's a, fair. he's a UFC fighter. Right. And, okay. uh, I asked him today on our weekly chat. Right. I was like, um, when's the last time you spent time by yourself? Like I want, cause I'm trying to wonder what he, I was wondering what he wanted in life. Like, what does he want to do now? Yeah. Where does he stand? He's had some major, major life changes recently. Hmm. And, uh, he said, you know, I've lived on my own really since I was 14 years old. And he said, I realized the other night, um, after you asked me this question that, uh, I've really never spent any time alone. Even while living on his on his own Even for the majority of his, his life, life, that he would always reach for his phone, call somebody, uh, and he recently moved in by himself. But he finds himself immediately when he's alone, wanting to call and invite somebody over. Hmm. He, even before like making sure his place is set up, hmm. like automatically he he needs somebody's presence there. Yeah, um, and that's what I'm trying to trying to get at with all of us, right? With jujitsu, is take that time to yourself and like. Yeah. Um, be in the moment. So present. you know what you want, be present. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that we, we have a, a reason for that and give it backing and give it real world, real world, um, examples. Right. You know, which I feel like that, you know, my example from this week is just, it's kind of fascinating to me as I like look at it from a, from an outsider's perspective, because being in the moment for the sake of being in the moment is like, for me it has always seemed kind of fairly useless like for what to what end right yeah so i've I've been meditating for several years um since i really since i got home from argentina really when i was 21 so i've been meditating for about seven years and i always kind of hated like the sentiment around meditating which kind of seemed like oh if you just i'm being crude again about this but if you get to the state of zen then like that's where you find peace but to me it was always like i need to use this as a tool to help me achieve something that's actually really meaningful right and so as i started meditating what i found was like it really was a tool to discover like what my weaknesses were and so that's the end right to to what end well like jujitsu for me to what end to discover who i am so that i can be a better human and yeah it's fun and like there's some cool other like additional benefits but like to what end? Because I want to be a better husband, you know, like all of those, Absolutely. all those things that matter most. Um, yes, yeah, so it's been awesome. Dude. Here's, the, here's the next quote I have with that. Okay. Uh, because, I, and I just feel like it, let me just see it. So it says, this is something I read a couple of weeks ago and it says, I don't remember who they asked, but here was the, here was the, I should find out who it was. I usually write this kind of thing down, but I didn't. <laughs> it says the key to life is to put everything you got into everything you do. Hmm. Sounds like Vince Lombardi or something. Some coach. It probably was some coach, (laughs) right? Um, But when I really think about that, what I really come back to is, are we really giving every, are we really giving it everything we got? If, if you're distracted, Hmm. if you're off your, if you got your phone, your text messages, if you got the radio, if you got people around you, if you got a job to do, if you got kids, if you got a wife, if you got the construction noise, the, the highway of cars driving by us, are you ever really able to give it all you got if you if you don't know how to focus? Mm-hmm. If you don't know how to be in the moment, are you ever really giving it all you got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Right. So then that brings us back to to the jujitsu of what am I trying to do? I'm tr- I feel like I'm trying to teach our minds to get to be in the moment, to give it all you got, and then when you go home, I'm I'm wanting you to stop and to give your thinking all you got. Hmm. 
Hmm. Not half, not a little bit, not, yeah, I'll worry about that later when the time is right. Not, yeah, I, I'm half eating, half reading, half listening to an audio book. Hmm. Like, no, like, I want you to really, really focus. What does it feel like to give it all you got in that moment? Hmm. D- does that make sense? Totally, yeah. So that's my process. That's real. Those are the two things I'm really trying to do for you uh, in jujitsu is to get you to be in the moment and to teach your mind to be in the moment. Because I know if you're in the moment, meaning what? Meaning if you're giving it 100% everything you got to what you're doing, I know you'll be successful. Yeah. Beyond in measure, right? In anything. Yep. Dude, that's a, I talk about that a lot with with um, my this sales job is essentially like all we're really doing is learning some copy and paste principles that you can go apply to the things that really matter. Like, so, you know, I, I work with young, young guys and girls that are like going knocking doors to like set cold call people. So it's the <laughs> hardest thing you could possibly do in the heat. It's like the most adverse situation um, to make money basically without a uh, credentials or a degree or anything like that, in my opinion, at least. But that's why I love it so much because it's really teaching people who they are, right? And so yeah. I'm seeing so much crossover between so like, much. so much crossover between not only jujitsu, but just hard things in general. They, like you said, adversity introduces to you who introduces you to who you really are. And um, without that single-minded focus, you can't actually succeed at it. You can't. Yeah. And so it's this copy and paste thing where like, why does it matter? Well, listen, it matters way more than just this thing. It matters in how you're, how you do anything is how you do everything wherever you are be there it matters in how you are a a husband it matters in how you parent your kids it matters in like who you are for the people in your life and uh, i always talk about this idea of like in in seven habits of highly effective people stephen covey um, one of the first things that he does in that book is says how do you identify what you really value just imagine and i'm again this is my version of this imagine you're a fly on the wall at your funeral and you have people from every aspect of your life talking about you and you have to give them a truth serum. They have to be honest. What do you want them to say about you? And that right there, <laughs> yeah. oh, that right man. there is like, that's how you identify what you care about most. Yeah. So like, do you, you think that you want, you actually, if you could actually put yourself in that situation, would you want people saying, oh, you know what? I loved Hayden so much because he just made so much money in his life. He's the best. Like, no, nobody cares about that. But what do you, what would you want your kids to say though, right? Yeah. What would I want my parents to say if they could come <laughs> back and talk, I guess. <laughs> yeah, all right. right <laughs> what would I, what would I, what would I want the people that I served with in my church to say or in my community that had no vested interest financially in working with me? What would I want people who are different in different walks of life to say about me? And that's where like why does that stuff matter? Well, because I think I would probably want to give everything I had to those things because they matter most, you know? Absolutely. So, we got deep there fast but that's how we roll and that's how we do it have you ever heard it that makes me think of i've I've been wanting to say this for a while but have you ever heard that term of like how was this described to me it was like like just like like you're saying like i'm saying when we're faced in the face of adversity we find out who we really are Mm -hmm. but they were saying like the example was when you're squeezed you find out what what's really inside of you right yeah, when you're the squeezed. Juice. yeah and it was like when you squeeze an apple only apple juice could come out right mm-hmm. like you squeeze an orange oh, dude, <laughs> apple juice is not coming out of that orange no matter how hard you squeeze no matter what you do <laughs> you might pretend that apple <laughs> yeah. juice might want you might want apple juice to come out but but it's an not orange is out. always an orange and i think us as humans is the same thing hmm. and that's why i love to put people in that bad position because i want to squeeze them Hmm. And I want to see what comes out. Dude. But humans, like unlike apples, can like change actually. Yeah, but right? Because yeah, cause, yeah. cause this is what I love about what you do. And I have a cool story <laughs> yeah. for you after this. <laughs> you love that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I have a, uh, what I love about your approach to just life in general, it's been really fun to like connect with, is um, you're not trying to put someone in that bad position to make them submit so that you win. Right. It's like, yeah. I mean, maybe if you're in a competition, yeah, like right. it, but because the goal is winning, but you're, what you're really trying to do is you're teaching someone is expose them to who they really are so that they can choose to be who they really want to be. Yes. You know? And that's like, yes. that's powerful, man. And, and once you have that knowledge, like they can do whatever they want with it. Right. Yeah. And that, just like you said, man, to me, that's the real joy in, in jujitsu. And, and that's why I like to use jujitsu in teaching whoever I'm teaching. Uh, even if it's 
more of a mental game, right? I yeah. always love to use jujitsu because I can show them who they are, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you can say in this example, I did this. I know I was forced to do it. I forced myself to do it, right? But like when it when you're really squeezed though, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Okay, let me tell you a story really fast uh, uh, related to that. So um, I'm a, in my late teens and I, I got to go um, on uh, is a, a mission for my church. And I was in the, a high level organization where I got to work with just amazing individuals, amazing people. And I was talking with like the kind of the head of this organization. Um, his name is Alfredo. He's a really cool dude. He's amazing. And he'd been in business his entire life. He used to run an entire sales org for a tech company in all of Brazil and all of South America. So Brazil and uh, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile. He was over the sales org that was sell that was managing and selling um, computer software to businesses for all of South America. Okay. Really smart guy. Wow. And then he also was serving um, in this mission as well. So he was managing everyone in it. And I was talking to him because he was. He came to me and he was like, hey, I, I have a, um, someone who's working in this organization as well. And uh, some of my, leader, my leadership has said that we need to send him home because he's not, he's not really like following the rules. He's not bought in. And hmm. he's, he's, he's done enough to merit like being sent home and like he shouldn't be here. And, uh, and so I was like, oh, interesting. Like, so you had one of your, one of your authorities tell you that you needed to send him home. They're like, he was like, well, he gave me the opportunity to send him home the, like the chance if I wanted to. And this was his argument. He's like, what do you think about this Hayden? And he goes, his argument was if you keep one bad apple in the batch, it's going to spoil the whole batch. So you got to send him home because he's just a bad apple. And he's like, you know what I'm going to do Hayden? And I was like, what? He goes, I'm not going to send him home. And I was like, well, why? It seems like it's decent counsel, right? Like yeah. one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. What you wouldn't want that to spoil your whole, whole organization, right? And keep in mind, this guy was like very successful in business. And so he's managing essentially a nonprofit is how I would describe right. it, uh, my mission. And uh, he goes, you know why I'm not going to send him home? And he's like, because I just have a really hard time viewing people like they're fruit. <laughs> That's awesome. Isn't that so cool? That's so sweet. This guy is amazing, dude. dude no way. He was amazing. But he's also no like way. the most like incredible no competitor, way. like driven individual. No Everybody way. who's so kind and compassionate. And I'll never forget that. And the, but that's how that's yeah. how like I work. That's why I really like enjoy um, what we're doing. And I really I love like love winning the right way because like humans, unlike <laughs> apples, can change who they are. Right. That's what he was saying. He's yeah. like, I just have a hard time viewing people like their fruit. He's, <laughs> what a setup, dude! Huh? What he was a so setup good, dude. For that. He was so poetic oh, and like he was. Dude. He's like a salesman at heart, dude. but he's just a really good person. So. The way he like set up the whole story oh, is awesome. But um, yeah, I like, uh, that's, I mean, that's just how we roll, right? Like, yeah. And it's, it's, well, it's really why we do it and it's what we're about and it's why we continue to learn uh, about the mind and how it works. Right. Yeah. And what are the advantages of it? I was talking to, uh, my neighbor recently and he, me and him were, were chatting, chatting and he had brought up to me that, uh, that psychology for many years the whole idea of it was to find out what was going wrong in the brain. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that now it's a fairly new concept, like within the last five years that we're trying to make the, see what works in the brain, meaning sure. yeah, like yeah. brain hacks, right? Like how do we, <clears throat> yeah. how do we make it better than, and how do we use it properly? And to me, I'm like, dude, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Like totally use that and how to make, how, how find out how to make us better. And I, I'm a firm believer. Like we're saying, the first thing you have to do is find out what's going on Yeah, and let the person you have see to. it. You have to. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, there's this, my, one of my favorite quotes from seven habits of highly effective people again by Stephen Covey. He says, and I have, we'll do it this next time, but I have, I want to read like an excerpt, excerpt, excerpt from it next time. But one of the quotes from the very first habit, habit one, be proactive. He says, um, until one can honestly admit that who they are today is a result of the choices they made yesterday. <laughs> they cannot say, I choose otherwise. Hold on, say that again. So yeah, it's, 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 I, every time I say this, I have huge. to say it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. So he says, until one can honestly admit that who they are today is because of the choices they made yesterday. Who I am right now is a result of who I chose to be by my actions, right? Until I can honestly acknowledge that, I can't say, I choose yeah. otherwise. Yeah, so what absolutely. he's saying is the first step 
the first step to becoming someone who you want to be or becoming someone better or the best version of yourself, the first step is actually just acknowledging who you really are yeah. and accepting the fact that you are who you are because of choices that you've made, either habitual choices or allowing yourself to fall into you know habits or be or or just go with the flow or or follow people the way you were raised like you have to acknowledge that it's the sum total of the choices and the desires that you have that's gotten you where you are and until you acknowledge that basically it's your fault you chose the life that you have you can't say you can't choose otherwise you actually can't it's impossible to that's huge, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. That, I, I love that because like that's been, again, my realization just a lot lately is like, I want to be the best version of myself. Well, how? You have to know where you are. A map of Chicago doesn't work if you're in LA, right? Yeah. So like you have to acknowledge like, where am I? Well, if I'm using a map for Chicago and I'm trying to navigate Los Angeles, <laughs> I, there's, that's, a, that's losing it. all the, I'm going to lose every time because I have no idea where I am. I, yeah. I, I don't know where I'm starting, right? Absolutely. So this powerful man like it's just real though it's real it's interesting um and i just think when i think of like what 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 i am so one year i was as i was thinking about about like how do you punish the criminals i thought like how would i punish myself really what would i do to punish myself huh um and really you know what i came up with i came up with lack of progress yeah being stagnant and the more i thought about it the more the more I think about it, the more I think that would be hell to never be able to make any progress. Like whether you were like, couldn't make progress in your marriage, couldn't make progress in your work, couldn't make progress in anything you do. Imagine if you were trying to go somewhere, LA, we were trying to drive that and we could never make any progress. <laughs> yeah, getting there. It's frustrating. <laughs> like huh. that, that's hell to me. And like, that's again, another reason why I'm so passionate about helping people uh, learn to progress. Because progress is happiness. Yeah, dude, I love that. It really is. I mean, um, and you know, you and I were both reading How Champions Think recently. Yeah. Did you finish it? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah? Oh yeah. Probably read it a couple times. <laughs> yeah, <so absolutely>. imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, But that's like what Bob Rotella says in How Champions Think is uh, the common trait or one of the common traits of a, a true champion, someone who's achieved a very high level in their profession or in sports or in whatever they've chosen is they become obsessed with the process. They're married to the process and to the um, the progress and not to just the results, the end outcomes, right? So yeah. like someone, the example of this would be someone in business who is married, they love the fact that they love improving rather than just the whatever their money goal is that year. Or they, they love um, increasingly having a better product rather than, just like, oh, when we get to this level, then I can coast and I'm good and I'll just milk it out until, you know, I just make my money right. and I'm done or whatever, right? Or like in right. your situation, it's like, I mean, I imagine that a lot of the choices that you've made going from the UFC or fighting into acting and all those things have been because they're challenging, right? Like it's the progress, yeah, not just the end result. And I think that's what makes uh, this podcast really interesting for me and I would imagine for you as well is that like, we're tracking your progress in this as yeah, well. We're also cool. tracking mine, mine as well. Hmm. Um, but like, we're tracking your progress, and also we're not trying to sell anything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're not. It's not like we're trying to sell anything. We don't have a product behind us. We're trying to push. Like this is us, our real life, and and we believe in it. Yeah, we believe in it. We're not selling anything. This is for us and what we believe, and we're just sharing it with people. And those ideas, I think, people just aren't really. Um attuned to how impactful they could be for them. And so like when you hear it, it's almost like <clears throat> for the first time, right? It's almost like jumping into like an ice cool lake and like being awoken to like <laughs> yeah. reality. And you're like, oh my gosh, like I didn't realize how this is cold, right? Like you're just, you're, yeah. you're not lulled to it's sleep anymore. Yeah, you, you find, you kind of come to this aha moment, these realizations like, oh man, maybe this is actually like impactful. Maybe this could help me. Maybe I'm not just destined to be who I've always been before. Right. I can actually change, um, be happier or whatever the case. Absolutely. I have, I have one last quote for you. Yeah, dude, uh, and this one's for you, man. Stories. Okay. This let's one, hear it. this one's really for you. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to find this okay. for you. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's not too, too serious, but it's kind of like, uh, okay. it goes along with kind of what we've been talking about. Kind of like the whole CNN effect. I have to be a little vulnerable. The whole analysis paralysis uh, yeah, yeah. thing 
Right. So uh, here it goes. It's uh, dude. Are we wearing the same? No, I was gonna say. I think we both might have Nike reacts on. Oh, do we? Let's see. Where's this thing at? I looked it up. I tried to write it down. I tried to look it up for you, but uh, I got. Hold on. Give me a moment. You're good. All right. Here we go. And and this goes with like. This goes along with like what I'm trying to say about being in the moment or about, you know, like we just live in that information age where we're constantly, constantly like wanting more and more and more and more information. Right. Yeah. Um, and one of the things with you, I think this quote, I got this quote just for you because a lot of times when you're you, because you have that personality, that obsessive personality is what we call it. Right. Or yeah. what you called it where you're like, dude, I'm in on jujitsu and I'm going to be all in. Like I'm going to gather all <laughs> kinds of information. Right. And it doesn't just go for jujitsu for you. It goes it's for everything. Uh, every, it's in everything, everything. If I want to be the best at sales, you. I'm going to learn everything about it. Sales, psychology practices, how the theory, everything, right. If I want to get good at lifting weights, I'm going to learn everything about it. The mechanics, like push myself to the hardest, the fullest. <laughs> like it's, yes. a, it is obsessive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what there's, and what we're trying to say, that's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. That's what makes you different. We know knowledge is power and we're encouraged to gain. We're trying to encourage people to gain knowledge as well. Sure. Yeah. But like, I, I would say at what point is it detrimental? Right. And it is there a point when it is detrimental. Yeah. And, uh, this quote came to, came to me, uh, it's from a book. It says what wild desires, what restless torment, Seize the helpless man who feels the book disease. Feels the book disease. The helpless man who feels the book disease. Huh. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is um, essentially not, it's not useless, but it's a, uh, if not actually applied, it's not, it's, um, tormenting at the, in the end, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is right. <clears throat> theory, yeah. theory for the sake of theory is not only a waste of time, but it's tormenting because you're always, um, if I theorize about making a million dollars a year and what it could mean, and I get excited about it, but I never actually do it. That's like, it's pretty it's tormenting. Oh. If I theorize, <laughs> theorize or get gain a bunch of book knowledge about having a good marriage or being really good in my career but i never actually do it like that's uh that's like hellish you know yeah the hollow man have you ever read that quote or um that um poem by i think it's by t.s Eliot, the hollow man we'll have to read that one okay. one time yeah um but yeah and, and i i bring that quote up for for you and for myself as well to say that like not only are we gaining this knowledge and sharing it with each other, but what we're really trying to do is apply that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I totally. mean? Totally. And we're trying to give real world examples of that. Right. Because without applying it, it actually doesn't, it, it's, it is useless, but in an, and tormenting. <laughs> 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 yes. Oh dude. So in, in like, cause how torment, so like, man, uh, let's say I go, you know, do my thing, make dinner. Don't clean the kitchen again. I have the knowledge that I need to now. I should, but I don't for another hundred days straight. Oh no! And then Sarah comes to me and she's like, "Listen, I you just got you got like, why aren't you doing this? Come on, it's like getting really frustrating. Not only that, like, look at all the other things that you're doing. This is so frustrating. That's like pretty hellish. It's in and of itself, yeah. right? Because you extrapolate that out. If it's if the kitchen's the only thing that's like the most apparent, what else am I doing? Not talking, you know, like not touching base, not actually taking care of her needs, not like serving." Yeah, uh, that sounds like pretty bad over time, <laughs> right? And then what if I do that to my employees too? What if you go do that to your kids? What if like oh, we do that to our man. friends? It's like, that's, what if you have the knowledge of how to be a good friend, but you never actually do it? Dude. That sucks, you know? Dude. Yeah, I mean. Or in theory, right? In that's theory, it sucks. Yeah, it's, it's, I heard this this week too. It was like, the word water doesn't get you wet. I <laughs> do. That's cool. <laughs> the word water does. He, yeah. You got to jump in, man. If you want to get wet, you got to get in <laughs> the there. The word water doesn't get you wet. I, yeah. Listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video doesn't mean you got better at anything. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right. We just got a whole bunch of knowledge. Uh, and again, that's what brings us back, brings me back to like 
what are we doing as a society, right? Like we have all this information, we're bombarded with it nonstop, hmm. and yet we never take that time to, to apply it. Um, and I believe that to apply it, we need that moment to ourself. Yeah. Uh, that moment of clarity where, it, where you have that moment of peace. Hmm. You know? Yeah, totally. That's interesting, man. Um, so last week we talked about, uh, you mind if I asked you about the John Jones story? Yeah, let's do it. So last week we kind of teased this story of, uh, <laughs> riches. So I guess as a backdrop, um, from what I understand, a lot of people think that John Jones is one of the greatest fighters of all time. And I've just heard people say this as I'm watching, like, I think Joe Rogan said it several times, commentators in the UFC, they think he's like the greatest UFC fighter of all time. I'm yeah, sure you have your own hard, opinions on It would be hard this. to dispute, though. Right? Um, and so that's kind of the backdrop. He's acclaimed as the greatest, one of the greatest fighters of all time, <laughs> if not the greatest. But you know John pretty well. You're one of the coaches that the gym he trained at. Yeah. yeah will you tell us that story I, that we I teased know last John, week? I know John to an extent. I don't know John on a, on a level that I would like to mentally, right? That would be to know somebody yeah. is, is, a, is a whole conversation in itself, right? Sure, I sure, know yeah. you because I grapple with you because I get to see who you really are. Um, I taught at Greg Jackson's and there's two classes at this time, I don't know how they do it now, mm -hmm. but at Greg's there was two classes, heavyweights trained and then uh, lighter weights trained, right? Okay. And we kind of went back to back. Um, and sometimes when the lighter weights would show up, uh, the, some of the heavyweights would stick around, right? The heavier okay. guys. Um, John's a heavyweight? How big? John is trying to transition to heavyweight, but he currently, he, currently yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think I had read that he's like 265 or something wild right from now? his manager. Yeah. Gosh. Something huge. Uh, I think that's what it was, but we'll have to double check that. Sure. And all, it should be noted that John's not just, how can I say, you know who John's brothers are, right? I don't know. I don't, I don't know much about him. <laughs> John's brothers, John's family, not only is John considered could be considered the best MMA fighter of all time or the best combat sports fighter of all time, but his family could be considered the greatest athletic family in the history of sports. Really? Yeah. Just like two weeks ago, John's brother got like a huge amount of sacks for the NFL, like broke a record or tied a major record. What team record. does he play for? I, right now, I think, I don't watch football too Dude, much. Dude, I don't either. But <laughs> like, yeah, so both of his brothers played in the NFL and I know one of them still does. And he's he's one of the best players in the end. Like he'll make the Pro Bowl. Like Dang, these dude. dudes are amazing athletes. John's families could be considered one of the most athletic families ever. Okay, both his brothers played in the NFL, and John's arguably the greatest MMA fighter of all time. Right? Like that's a big deal, man. Could you imagine? Like, yeah, my brothers play in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like, come on now. Um, uh, so I think that should be noted. But I don't know. So anyhow, and then I taught for Greg Jackson. Later on, he would have classes for uh, sometimes the amateurs or sometimes uh, just different classes that he had had going on. And I would teach those classes. Sometimes I taught the the uh, pro fighters as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I got the opportunity to grapple with John Jones one day. And, and there was a, a little setup to it because the heavyweights had just finished and the lightweights were going. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pretty confident in my grappling. I, I believe in my grappling. And I, others do as well. But uh, <laughs> we were getting ready. Greg, the kind of the structure is Greg teaches for 15 minutes, kind of goes over some technique. And then from there, uh, we often would get would would get with a partner and do what's called live grappling. On this particular day, it was live grappling, and he'd wanted us to do, be like light on the strikes, heavy on the grappling. Okay. Um, and we all started to partner up, and and out of nowhere, John Jones stands up and he says, uh, "Who wants to get tapped out today? <laughs> like, which one of you guys is ready to get tapped out?" And people are partnering up, and, and I, I was kind of the odd man out. Sometimes you you have odd numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And John says it again. Who wants to get tapped out today? So, of course, <laughs> I, 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 I guess it's me, John. Um, and maybe I didn't say I guess. Maybe I was a little excited. Maybe I was like, yeah, right here, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, let's go. No, right? you, you probably. I'm sure I were was. pretty excited. And uh, John had recognized that that uh, I sounded a little confident, and I think he, I don't know what he was thinking, but he took it up a notch. He said, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play a game with you. He said, uh, how do you want me to tap you? And I thought, wow, all right, that's kind of like raising the stakes, right? <laughs> and I said, 
I you don't back down from a challenge ever, ever. I said, well, if <laughs> I said, John, I'll do you one better. I said, have you ever played pool? He says, yeah. I said, I played jujitsu like pool. You got to call your shot before and I'll even give you a countdown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll even give you a countdown. Uh, it just so happened that John Jones was on his back. So I was starting in his guard. Okay. Okay. John lies down, the round starts, and I start to give him a countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Uh, and I grab him, grab his, his uh, left foot, and I toe hold him. I tap him out, right? And you had called it before. And I said, toe hold. Yeah. You know, left foot in 10 seconds. Boom, catch it. <laughs> okay. And uh, so he taps. So he taps. And you could see he's got Toe like, hold's pretty bad. A toe hold, it's not actually quite, it's not too bad. I mean. It's not like a heel hook. No, it's not like a heel hook. It would break your toe, and then you would kind of get some ankle dislocation. So what is it? What is you're trying to bend the toe the opposite way that it's yes. supposed to so on the ankle? So you're taking this, the idea, and I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I have a, I don't know if I'm supposed to mention this. I told my brother-in-law. Anyhow, I have a doctor that does MRIs while I'm holding a, a, a joint or a ligament or a move <laughs> and he tells me he he tells me exactly what's happening so you so go that do, i know how to properly uh break it i guess it's fine if you don't say who it is right so you <laughs> yeah. so you yeah. go wait hold dude, on dude, so dude you, you go, know me you, <laughs> you're like the the the, sur the surgeon of all dude. things uh like jujitsu so you go you go take a joint ligament bone whatever yeah and you put it in the stressed so there's it's the stressed position and then you have you have a doctor do an MRI on it so he can tell you yeah. what's happening in the joint. Yeah. And how to properly to break it. How like, to break it. Because I mean, with a toe hold there's he said so the, the doctor said there's three ligaments. There's a ligament here, ligament here, ligament here. He said the first one in most like combat sport athletes or even athletes, that first ligament's already broken anyways. Really? Yeah. He said because of the movement of our ankle. So do you just not need it? You just don't it's need it. It's not like a like a ACL or it's not like an ACL. You, know, it's like you don't need it. He said, so if you angle it here and, and it doesn't go, what you want to do is twist it around. So we, and he goes, and then the second one will pop. And then the third one. And then after the third one, this toe, your small toe will come all the way up. And I've done this in a tournament. I did this in a tournament uh, in Atlanta where I broke the guy's ankle and it went whoosh, all the way up here. And when ankles do that, it's quite wild because it doesn't. Dang, dude. You almost want to have that look, but you don't because it just looks like rubber. Like the human body is amazing, like, right? What? It looks like gum. There's nothing like, even holding it there uh -uh, anymore. Nothing, nothing at all. It goes bloop, and then you let it go and it goes bloop, and it goes right back. Dude, that's, <laughs> dude, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i catch john in this boom he taps out okay and he, he's kind of fired up like oh, all right i bet you can't do that again i bet you i can do it again right <laughs> right foot ready for the countdown right 10 foot, toe 9 holds. 8 yeah. right foot toe hold right at the end of 10 seconds you were in his guard again oh, i was in his guard again um and keep in mind and i'll say this because this is the truth meaning a long-legged person with a leg lock going, and then a leg lock specialist going which against are. him, me, uh, which I am, which really means the odds were really stacked in my favor in this. Okay, <laughs> so like I have these long, skinny legs, and dude, I'm a leg lock guy. Like this is like because yeah, John's legs are like this is truly like he's lanky. This is like dessert for me, right? Like I, I know I'm going to beat you from this from this position. Okay. So you took, well, this is uh, keep going, but cause I want to dissect that. That's actually like really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't remember if this happened four times or if it happened two, but regardless, John stands up and he chucks his mouthpiece across the gym and he's fired up. Right. And in, in, this isn't a bunch of nobodies. These are professional athletes. Right. So I vividly remember guys like uh, Demacio page who fought in the UFC. Um, he fought in the WEC, heavy puncher fought on the tap out show mm. dude this dude's loud and he's he's a friend that i've known since high school and a, a guy i've known since high school he starts standing up loving it laughing right he's like oh rich is working you like people are starting to get in john's face right greg jackson's just sitting in the corner he's not doing nothing right john's pissed throws it well i bet you rich i bet you you can't hold me down for 30 seconds i bet you can't hold me down for 15 seconds I look at him dead in his eye. I said, John, I bet you I sub you before 15 seconds is up. <laughs> he says, it's like that. Huh? I said, it's like that. He got back down in his guard. 
10 seconds, tapped him out, dude. <laughs> this dude, I've never, ever in my life seen somebody react this way to being submitted. Stormed out of the gym. And I mean stormed out of the gym, okay? Hmm. This guy leaves. Next day, right? Next day, I'm at the front desk at Greg's. I don't know. I was at the front desk. John walks in. And this dude, Why, what's up, John? He goes, not today, not today. He walks away. A couple days go by. This dude, and I started to notice that he started to ignore me. It's like not even acknowledging. Not you. even acknowledge me. And then I'm like, wait, what the heck? Like, this dude's not even acknowledging I'm in the room ever. Like, dude, <laughs> I started to notice, like, his mentality was like, not only in his mind did it not happen, but like, I didn't exist as a person. <laughs> like, completely ignoring me. Dude, in one year, um, a co- or I guess a couple months after that, I was uh, in the gym in the afternoon, kind of off hours doing a session with Diego Sanchez. He had a fight coming up. Sure. And uh, John Jones walks in. I remember John walking in and, me and, and he came and watched me and Diego grapple a little bit. And I remember he was kind of watching. And I didn't have a problem. Watch all you want, man. Like, your legs are, are not getting any shorter <laughs> shorter in this scenario. Like, we go from that position, same thing's going to happen. <laughs> Anyhow, um, after we finished up, I noticed John came up to Diego and was like, hey, what are you guys doing? And me and Diego had planned to go out to, to lunch, right? Mm-hmm. He was going to take me out to lunch. And John was like, hey, where are you guys going? He's like, oh, we're going to Flying Star. Okay, we're going to go too. And I, I didn't know what we are going to go to meant, but apparently it meant John and his crew were going to go, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm still like, John, even in this scenario, John hasn't acknowledged me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like he just who are you with again Diego, Diego Sanchez, Sanchez yeah. yeah like he hasn't acknowledged me right okay so I'm like this is gonna be interesting we'll see what happens here right <laughs> yeah so uh we go to Flying Star and Flying Star is a restaurant Dude, where you Flying order the best. so good huh yeah you order and then you go sit down right so we're in the line maybe like six seven eight guys and John's crew got there first so they were in the front of me and Diego and John goes to the first person in line who's his friend hey what are you gonna order oh that sounds good hey I got you like, I'll pay for your lunch, right? He does the second guy, third guy, fourth guy. Yeah, yeah. All the way to Diego. Hey, what are you getting? Yeah, I, I got you, Diego. He, and I'm, I was in the back of the line, and he goes, hey, Rich, what are you ordering? And this is what I'm ordering. He's like, I don't got you, bro. <laughs> first time he acknowledges you. <laughs> first time he's ever acknowledging you, right? I don't got you, bro, stands up and starts to turn. And Diego pushed him. Diego Sanchez pushed him. In line while in you guys line, were right there? yeah. And he's like, hey, no, 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 no. I got us. I got us. And he he defended me. He backed me up. He's like, I got you, bro. Uh, and John, I didn't know what was going to happen. But because uh, Diego. John's kind of known for like doing crazy stuff in like bars and clubs and like. Yes. Right. And having, yes. uh, let's say, uh, <laughs> yes. lots of legal fees to make them go away. Yeah. Those and types and, of things, right? And Diego's known to be wild too. Is he? He's crazy too. Yeah. Like Diego's, Diego's, Diego's an all in person, man. If he decides <clears throat> he's going to back you up, he's going to back you up. Sounds like a like, loyal dude too. He's loyal, man. Yeah. Like this dude, he's a, this is a different cat. This is Diego Sanchez. He's the first, the ultimate fighter one winner. Really? Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. So like um anyhow uh john ended up backing out he ended up saying uh no i was just kidding i was just kidding (laughs) and uh, somehow some way we all ended up having lunch together Uh, i don't remember much of what was saying was said i somewhere along the lines of these two john and diego were talking about like i think it was like being overconfident or something like that which is kind of a i mentioned that only because it's just funny to have those two guys discussing that right being overconfident you know? <laughs> exactly uh, that's but yeah funny, that's dude. the story it's a true story uh it that's happened. crazy um what's so a couple of things that i like like from that story is uh one that i just re- picked up on today you knew what his weaknesses were going into it but he was almost like so bullheaded Right, that he didn't. He was just so bent on like being the guy that was like, yeah, who's who am I? Who am I submitting today? Who am I taking a tap today? Who wants to lose? Right? And you're like, (laughs) okay. So he didn't even realize that you were putting, you were compromising him before it even started. Right? Had no idea, no idea. Dude, that's that's wild. I mean, that's kind of cool because like that's, I mean, you in a nutshell. It's a. It's not even about just like the competitiveness. You're you're like five steps ahead playing chess, right? Absolutely, yeah. It was a losing situation for him from the start. Yeah, I I should have mentioned that at the end when John stormed out and left the gym uh, and when 
teammates were yelling at John, making fun of him. I should mention that Greg, for the first time in that whole time, did stand up after, chased after John and was like, hey, John, John, no, no, you're like, you're just a perfect matchup for Rich. You got super long legs. And I don't know what ha- that what if they ever talked about that again, mm-hmm. like John and Greg. Um, but I know that Greg knew that. Greg knew from the beginning uh, that that was going to happen as well. And I sometimes wonder, like, why did Greg let that happen? Because if you're somebody's head coach and you see this happening, like, what was Greg's thinking? Well, especially if you know your guy's going to respond that way. Like, that could be pretty bad for his morale, right? Yes. Especially if you know that, like, the way John always wins is because he's just, like, stupid confident. Like, irrationally confident. So if you let that confidence get shattered, like, that could be really bad for him, right? Yeah. Did his grappling get better after that? Uh, you know what's wild, man? To this day, uh, I have ton- have had tons of interactions with John, and he still never really acknowledges me. Really? Yeah, like uh, I went back, not quite a, well, I guess I've been in Utah for a while now, but just before I moved to Utah, I know I'd went in, which would be around like four years ago or so. I went into Greg's, and Greg said, hey, why don't you teach the, teach the class for me? And I said, absolutely. Uh, and it was the night pro class, and John was there. And uh, then when we were grappling live, um, John s- little bit would acknowledge me, but still has never really, really that's wild, acknowledged dude. me. And like, dude, to me, that's a different cat, man. That's crazy. But it also is this, the other, my second takeaway from that was, well, first was just the chess game you were playing, which is kind of funny, <laughs> right? Because what do you always say in jujitsu? It's not like, you know, I weigh like 230 pounds right now. Even though I'm much bigger, um, the way to submit me is just to put your, how much do you weigh? Right now, like 190, 190. Your 190 against my 230 pound for pound is probably not going to go super well for you. No. But your 190 against this <laughs> shin bone, right? Yeah. Or yes. against, against like these three ligaments, that's, a, that's, a, that's pretty good odds for you. Exactly. Your 190 against my bicep or the bicep slicer or your 190 against this vein in my neck like yeah that's what you're trying to do is play the game of leverage right you're playing the le- game of leverage and you're trying to put yourself in a position to win right put yourself in which you were doing from the beginning your, which from he had the no beginning, idea yeah he had no idea yeah he didn't even realize it second takeaway for me was um good or bad that has to be the reason why he is i mean good or bad meaning morally oh yeah that characteristic of him like this, I call it failure amnesia with my, with my, the crew that I work with. That has to be the reason why he is so good at fighting. Yeah. Because he just is like that failure, like doesn't exist for him and no, and you being involved in that failure, you don't exist for him. Right. And so, I mean, he's so upset about that, that it's uh it's gone. It's like, I can't even acknowledge that that's real because like I have to maintain the fact that I'm like this person or whatever. Do you think that's one of the reasons why he's so good? Hey, yeah. So successful in the fighting room? Yeah, I think we we all know the power of the mind and how important the mind is in any athletic event or, or on the battlefield, right? Sure. And like I think that his mind is powerful, but I would counter that with your example um in in your jujitsu journey is that and then you also mentioned about seven habits uh, about like if you can't acknowledge your faults uh-huh. Uh, where does that leave you as a human? Right. And the thing, and that's why I said good or bad morally. I don't know if that's necessarily moral per se, but um, what you going back to what you were saying before about extremes, analysis paralysis, for example, or taking anything to its extreme, is that actually good just for your life in general, right? Right. And that's a, that's a, that's that's yeah. an argument to be made. And I, I, one of the founder of the company I work for of Moxie, he, um, he has a, a home on Del Mar, which is where LeBron James got married. Um, he lives on that. He's a member of that course. He sees people there all the time. Phil Mickelson's at the clubhouse every day in the off season. Um, Steph Curry's there all the time. Like no very, way. like that's where people just go to hang out in their off seasons. Basically, a lot of high level athletes and actors and stuff. And I remember early on, and um, when I was selling and working for him, I asked him like, "That must be cool to like know all these like famous people." And he's like. It almost like dumbfounded, like well, I, I don't understand. No, not really. I was like, yeah, but isn't that isn't isn't that like cool to be around people you admire? I made the mistake of saying this, okay? This is why it was a mistake. Oh, isn't shoot. that cool being around people you admire? And he just looked at me and he was like, I only admire people who are admirable. 
And he, he's, so he goes like, <laughs> he's like this, I'm not going to say their names yeah. yet maybe, but he's like this person who you think is like famous, that's, he's not admirable because at the bar, when I walked by to get my food, he was telling the story about this thing that he said to his wife that like, I don't find that admirable. Dude. It's like, I thought he's like, I frankly, I found it pretty crude. Like I, I don't, I would never admire that person just because they're famous doesn't mean they're admirable. Dude, I will never forget that lesson though. Right. Dude. Which is why it's so interesting because like, you know, tons of like people who are excellent at what they do, famous in their realm, even famous in general by anyone's standards. That doesn't mean they're necessarily admirable. No. Nope. Right. No. Nope. And uh, that's the, that's my big lesson is like, I want to, you want to admire people who are admirable. And so th then it's just dude. about defining what that really means. Isn't that cool? Ah, That's dude, sick, huh? It's so amazing. It's so amazing. And it's so true. And we see it and we, we think we know people because we see them on TV or because we hear them give a talk or right. we read their book. And dude, we just don't know a lot of times who people, who people's character really right. is. Dude, I mean, and, and you'll go. So just because John Jones is making millions of dollars a fight and you only fights every so often videos about him in reaction to his fights at millions of views, right? Oh, absolutely. Acclaimed up and down for what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean he's an admirable person? I don't know, John, so I can't yeah. speak for that, but like, doesn't necessarily, that just means he's good at the thing that he chose to do and he's getting acknowledgement for it. But that doesn't mean that he's a good person necessarily, yeah, nor I does it mean that I'm a good person because I'm uh, relatively good at sales compared to most people or that you're a good person because you're good at jujitsu compared to most people. Right. It really is about how you apply being and, good at other things and, and that I, matter most. And I guess the truth is, is, is I have to be honest with myself in this scenario because I'm kind of, I'm kind of beating around the bush and saying, I can't, what I'm trying to say is I cannot sit here and tell you that I know who you are if I grapple with you and then say that I don't know who John is while I grappled with him. <laughs> Okay, I know who John you know is, who is, and I think I'm it's clear. I'm being careful because I don't know who yeah, he is. Yeah, I, I so. think it's clear um, who he is in that inter interaction that I've had with him. Grappling. Sure, and I I would I would back that assessment, and I would say that I do believe when I grapple with people that I know who they are, and that when I, I put them in it, bad right? positions, that the truth will come out, just like the Joker says, right when he when he's being uh, detained, when he says that he says, "You want to know how many of your friends I killed." Yeah. Right. And then he says, five, five of them. And he says, you know, in a way, I know your friends better than, better you, than did. you do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, do you want to know which ones of them were? Uh, yeah. What does he say? Which ones of them were like uh, rats cowards. or cowards? <laughs> cowards. That's right. Yeah. Cowards. <laughs> I love that he's the joker. Which is so, dude. But, and that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Jiu-jitsu really does do that. And it really does show who people are. Hmm. You know, and, and and regardless of how that would have went nowadays, I know there's people I won't teach. There's some people I won't teach. And what's your criteria what for that? I've heard you say this before. Number Ooh. one, uh, I have two criteria because sometimes I teach young kids as well. Number one is a parent can never reward them for doing it with me huh. in any way. They can't say, hey, I'll let you play video games if you do this with Rich or, hey, I'll give you. I work with some pretty pretty rich families, billionaires, right? They I don't I, they can never say, "Hey, we'll give you a hundred bucks to to do this lesson today." And if they do, then to I, their I kids, know I'm out, right? Yeah, yeah. They can out. never reward the kids for doing the activity. Why? Why is that your rule? Because I think the reward system is detrimental to how we progress in life and how we learn. <laughs> I think it beats up our learning process. And I'm a study guy, like you know, I'm a why guy. I want to know why people do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to make this quick because we've been going for a while now. Yeah, yeah. But really, one study always stuck out to me, and it was where they take kids, they put them in their room, and they say, "Clean your room, and we'll give you a candy or a reward for doing so." And they find out that after two weeks, the kids don't like doing it, and after three weeks, they hate the task and they love the reward. Yeah. Okay. And then they showed that like what was released for the brain when the kids got the reward and then how they hated the task they which means hated the task means they did the bare minimum necessary to achieve the reward right right and they take another group of kids and they say we want you to clean your room for pride because hmm. your room is a rep representation of who you are and they showed at first they didn't like doing it but after two weeks they started to like it and at the end they were doing the best job they were capable of doing hmm. and they were like that's interesting and they wanted to know why, so they looked at the brain and they found that the, the kids' brains 
were rewarding them on on their own. So the kid's brain was releasing the same uh, chemicals that the reward was releasing uh, for them. Interesting. So as the first group, so the the reward was um, uh, a candy or money. Right, right, right. So the, the so the reward system for the pride of doing it actually released those same the same thing. Interesting. So and, and to me it shows that our bodies know, man, our bodies know and I feel like I feel like that's what we're lacking as humanity. Like that's what we're lacking. We don't have any pride, man. Yeah. We're scared we're scared of the word pride because we hear puffed up in pride. Yeah. We, that scares us. But the truth that's not what pride is. Pride is do your best in everything you do. Like, no, man, it's a re- representation of who you are. Hmm. Like you said, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yep. Like how you clean your room. Show me. Yep. Like, do you clean up after yourself? Did you do the dishes? Hmm. Like, because it really is. And guess what? When you did that, your brain probably released a chemical and told you, good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're saying if, the, if someone's already always going after the outside reward, they're never letting themselves be really actually rewarded by the pride of doing something. And it's always just going to be depleting. Right? It'll like, always be depleting. And and really for me, I'm having a real big issue with this right now because my kids are going to school. And really, I believe oh. the school system is set up for this, meaning now they're doing something. Now they're saying, hey, you do this in class and I'll give you something. And guess what? It doesn't even have to be a physical thing. It's a, it's a made up thing. I'll give you a letter. Grade, yeah. I'll give you a letter. Right. Score, grade, whatever. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, what? A, that's manipulative to me. Like, we don't do that. Mm. We don't give rewards for playing sports in my house. We don't give rewards for doing your homework. You don't get a reward for working out. Like, no rewards here. Yeah. Your brain, your brain knows how to reward you. It knows how to take care of you. And I see this in life all the time because then the transition to that is what? Then you go to a job. You graduate college or high school and you go to a job and what? What do they say? Do this and I'll give you what? A paycheck. <laughs> I'll give you a paycheck, right? And then what happens to what happens to 95% of people? They hate their job, but they just love that reward, don't they? Yeah, or at least they tell themselves <laughs> to do it at first and it's diminishing returns. Right. And then check this out. Then there's another group, right? Then there's that 5%. And what happens? They come in and they do the best they can at the job they're given. And what do you think happens to that 5%? They excel. Yep. <laughs> because they're not doing it for a reward. Yep. Dude, we like I am as a, I'm, a, I'm me as a human, like, dude, I don't need a cookie. <laughs> like you I'm not a hamster. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Like I don't need a reward to do what I do. Huh. I do it because everything I do, I give it my all. Yep. Like I don't need a reward, man. I don't need a cookie. Like, I don't need to go to the hotel and see a, a cookie on my bed. I'm not a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this is what this is how we treat animals. Do this, say this word, and I'll give you this, dude. No. That's huge. No way, man. Huh? Like, where's the pride at? Can I? Uh, can I finish with this? I, I actually do want to read this thing from Seven Habits, and we can use please. this as a clip if more than anything. Okay. But so, um, in my job, I, um, I, I'm, I'm a sales leader, and uh, and so I part of our leadership training is, and this is one of the reasons why I love what I do is it's all focused on seven habits of highly effective people, becoming truly effective people in every facet of your life, all of your roles, right? All the things that matter to you most. And, and so what does that really mean? Becoming effective. And, and Covey lays this out in seven habits. I know it's one of uh, Stephen Covey's grandsons actually, and I had the chance to interview him and talk to him about Stephen Covey and this the whole journey and like what his favorite habits were and stuff. And as the more that I study, the reason why I'm talking about this is the more that I study seven habits of highly effective people, I, I, I have to study it every year for my job. Like if I want to um, excel at a high level in how the founder of my company has defined my job position, I have to study seven habits, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I choose to study seven habits of highly effective people every year because I constantly see how I'm awakened to who I really am because I'm comparing myself to these true principles of effectiveness, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So that's why I love it. And as a preface to that, that's why I'm studying it right now is because we're starting a new year of leadership and I have a new group of leadership. And so I'm, I've got a bunch of young people that I'm coaching on, on how to truly be effective leaders in every aspect of their life. And 
So I'm not going to just go tell them to read it and then me not do it too. Right. (laughs) So I've been studying it again at the gym. I'll kind of do the bike at the beginning to warm up and, and read. And, uh, this is one of the things. So I'm going to read this just a little bit and we can use this for a clip, even though we're going a little long, but because we are by nature proactive, if our lives are a function of conditioning and conditions, it is because we have by conscious decision or by default chosen to empower those things to control us. In making such a choice, we become reactive. Reactive people are often affected by their physical environment. If the weather is good, they feel good. If it isn't, it affects their attitude and their performance. Proactive people, on the other hand, can carry their own weather with them. Whether it rains or shines makes no difference to them. They are value-driven. Pride, right? (laughs) (laughs) And if their value is to produce good quality work... It isn't a function of whether the weather is conduct conducive to it or not. Interesting, right? (laughs) Yeah. Reactive people are also affected by their social environment. What's funny about that, carrying your weather with you, that idea is like it, in my job, like uh, I'm coaching people to go out and knock doors, cold call people in in outside in neighborhoods. Right. And so sometimes when it rains, I'll, uh, I'll get texts from like my, my sales reps and they'll be like, Hey, uh, Hayden, is it, is it raining over by you? And I know what they're asking. They're like saying, when can we stop doing this hard thing? Right. And I'm like, so, so I start to make the joke. They're like, Hey, it looks like there's clouds coming today. Guys, do you think we're going to be able to get any sales today? <laughs> Cause, <laughs> Cause I'm basically saying, yeah, is it the weather or is it you? Right. Cause you're in control last time I checked anyway. So yeah. reactive people are also affected by their social environment, by the social weather. So this is where he ties it in. When people treat them well, they feel well. When people don't, they become defensive or protective. Reactive people build their emotional lives around the behavior of others, empowering the weaknesses of other people to control them. The ability to subordinate an impulse to a value is the essence of a proactive person. So our ability Mm. to take our natural impulses and, and subordinate them to our own value system, to say, no, my values are greater than my impulses. That's the essence of a proactive person. Reactive people are driven by feelings, by circumstances, by conditions, by their environment. Proactive people are driven by values. Carefully thought about, selected, and internalized values. Proactive people are still influenced by external stimuli, whether physical, social, or psychological, but their response to the stimuli, conscious or unconscious, is a value-based choice or response. Um, As Eleanor Roosevelt observed, no one can hurt you without your consent. In other words, in the words of Gandhi, they cannot take away our self-respect if we do not give it to them. Interesting, huh? (laughs) It It is our willing permission, our consent to what happens to us that hurts us far more than what happens to us in the first place. Jeez. It's our consent, our submission to what happens to us. Yeah that hurts us more than what happens to us in the first place. Um, I admit this is very hard to accept emotionally, especially if we have had years and years of, of explaining our misery in the name of circumstance or someone else's behavior. But until, and this is my quote right here, dude, but until a person can say deeply and honestly, I am what I am today because of the choices I made yesterday, that person cannot say I choose otherwise. It's awesome, right? Dude. It's amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he tells a story about Viktor Frankl that's really interesting. Oh, man. And that's kind of where I thought of this was because you actually brought up a concept from yeah. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And uh, we'll, we'll tell that one next time. But that's, um, that's what I'm reading right now, man. It's so impactful. Every time I read it, I'm like, it's like I just jumped in a lake of cold water again. And I'm like, oh, I'm awake again, right? Yeah. I realized, like, man, I have to constantly wake myself from the slumber or else... I'm going to get lulled away. <laughs> I, I was asking myself the question today um, while I was re- reading. I'm rereading a book for the third time in like the last 45 days, right? This is the one on and your I back? Was like, a different one. Oh, no, no, this is a different one. <laughs> and okay. I was like, why am I rereading this book? And it just, it, it made me wonder like, is it better to read one book and like know it and understand it and apply, be able to apply it or to read like 50 books? Hmm. Would I have been better off really reading this book and really learning to apply it in my life instead of just reading it and never jumping in, right? Mm-hmm. Or would I have been better off reading a, a, a three different books? Yeah. And I just don't know. I mean, for me right now, I'm like, I would rather take my time and read this book 
Yeah. Like, I almost felt like the, for the starting the third time, I almost wanted to rush through it. I was like, oh yeah, I'll start a third time, but will I rush through it? <laughs> and dude, it's crazy because it's, I started it today and I'm like, I'm actually reading it slower than I have either of the first two times. Because you're trying to just like soak it in or what? It's just really so know good. It, apply it. Yeah, yeah, I'm really trying to know and apply it instead of just put the information, have information in, information out, right? Hmm. So I don't know, dude. That's huge, man. I I think we should probably finish here, but I, uh, it's just uh, this is good, dude. I feel like, yeah, I learned a lot this week. I I like what we're doing because I feel like it's almost a discovery as well, like in the process. You know, we don't have like mm-hmm. really talking points. Right. Maybe from the previous week or whatever, like I, we teased the John Jones story, which is kind of cool, but right. it's cool to like kind of discover some of these ideas in the process and really see how they apply to people. Next week, I want to read this story by Victor Frankl though. So like, awesome. don't let me forget that. Yep. Um, and then uh, you have a cool story you want to tease for people next week that we can like something from Hollywood. Man, I got, I got a big movie coming out. Uh, hopefully it comes out here in, at Thanksgiving. It's a movie with Tom Pelfrey. Uh, who's from Ozark from Ozark nice and I got to work with him on that and uh maybe we'll just talk a little bit about that let's movie. do it yeah I, I, I want to hear how you I, met him and how you um you kind of started to tell me a little bit about how like you're not really supposed to talk to like actors much on set right it's like kind of not a thing that you like socialize with each other I guess in this way dude, but you totally just dude. broke all norms on the set dude from what I, I understand I guess yeah like <laughs> Which is kind of, it sounds like what you did with Ali as well. Yeah, it's the same thing with Ali. Like, From Lone Survivor. Tom Pelfrey was a little bit different only because I was an actor in that as well. Like, I was in the actor's Fair room enough, with yeah. him. Like, it's not like you were a stuntman, it, he was the actor. Yeah, but it, it kind of came about the same way because I was like, I'm not going to sit here in this room and, like, not talk to this guy. <laughs> Dude, it's Hollywood so weird, cool. man, because all of a sudden, like, if it's just you, you and him that day, we're the actors, like, all of a sudden we're sitting in a room that's this size and like we're doing a lot of waiting because people got to set stuff up hurry up and wait hurry up and wait so we're sitting in this room and like you you've been in the trailers like Mm -hmm. but this is like the actor's room so we're on set waiting to be called out to set and like dude at first we didn't we didn't i'll just leave it at this at first we didn't say much but you know i'm not gonna sit there and not say (laughs) anything (laughs) yeah man i'm excited to hear that one um that's a i think that's cool Anyway, love you, brother. Thanks for doing this again. We'll see you next week. All right, guys, that's it. Thanks for watching our uh, second episode of the Anti-Fragile Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you liked what you heard, if you liked what you watched, please subscribe and like the video if you actually liked it. If you didn't like it, don't like the video. Maybe don't give a thumbs down, but don't like the video. (laughs) Um, And then uh, hit the subscribe button so that you can see more of this stuff. We are going to be posting a lot of these clips um, on our clips channel and maybe even have some footage. Whenever Rich talks about working with um, big name actors or with uh, with the high level UFC fighters, things like that, he's currently coaching a couple of UFC fighters right now that he's a little bit hush hush on. But whenever he talks about those cool stories, like the one he talked about with John Jones, next week we're going to talk about how he was the co-star in a movie um, with one of the stars in Ozark. Uh, if you like that stuff, you'll find it on Eclipse channel that I'll have posted in the link in the description here. So if you like this stuff, please like the video actually on YouTube. And then if uh, if you really want to show us like um, that this is impactful, please comment on the things that you like. Share it with other people. We really pre- appreciate you guys watching this stuff and, and support us as we're in this journey of like wanting to impact people with our ideas and our experience. I think it's kind of a cool interplay between I've never done anything like jujitsu or fighting before. Rich is one of my best friends. I love Rich to death. Um, and uh, I have a sales background. <laughs> and so it's cool to see how like all of the principles that we talk about really bleed over into every aspect of life. And especially if you apply them and the things that matter most, like your relationships and with the people around you that you love. So thanks guys for watching and we'll see you on the next one.